Hello. In this video, I'll be talking about part of section 13.2 on angles in the unit circle. <clears throat> this is quite a long section with some very important ideas, so I'll probably break it up. So just as an introduction, much of trigonometry will be related to angles, but we're not really going to think about angles exactly like we thought about them in geometry. In geometry, angles were very much from the point of view of what do they look like, right? I draw an angle like this, and it has a certain measure, like 42 degrees, and there's the picture. What we're going to do in many cases is think more about the angle as a measure of rotation. So just imagine you were standing forward, and I asked you to turn left 50 degrees. That 50 degrees is measuring how much you rotate. And we would think of this more as a motion than as a picture. Yeah, we might be able to draw a diagram that looks something like this to show how you turned, but really you would experience this as the motion of turning. So this is what we're going to be focusing on. Angles are measures of rotation. Right? If I ask you to spin 360 degrees, you would understand that that means to go all the way around. Now, what would that look like as a picture of an angle? That's very hard to visualize, but we understand the notion of spinning 360 degrees. And similarly, we're going to think of angles of rotation as being closely related to directions. Imagine I tell you to face in a particular direction, like face due east. Then I say spin left 60 degrees. So imagine here's like our bird's eye view. You're originally facing this direction, which is east. And then I ask you to spin to your left 60 degrees. You'll now be facing in that direction. So we're going to think of angles as related to directions. <clears throat> you spin a certain amount of degrees, and now you're pointed in a new direction. And so what I say here is we'll very frequently construct angles in a very specific fashion so that we will correspond to directions in a predictable way. And in fact, our picture of what 60 degrees looks like will often look like this picture. We'll have this sense that we start pointing to the right and then we rotate that way. This will be what's called standard position. <clears throat> so right away, an angle in the coordinate plane is said to be in standard position when its vertex, that's the corner of the angle, is at the origin, and one side, one ray from that angle, is the positive x-axis. Let's start by drawing a picture here. So we're thinking of our coordinate plane. Here's our x-axis. Here's our y-axis. So I'm going to imagine an angle where one of the sides of this angle is the x-axis like so. Right, it goes on forever, we'll just put an arrow. The vertex is at the origin, and then the other side of this angle can be in whatever direction we want. So this, for example, would be a picture of an angle in standard position. One of the sides points exactly to the right, starting at the origin and following the positive x-axis, and the other goes in any other direction we like. <clears throat> I guess it doesn't even have to be another direction. This side we will call the initial side. We think of that as the beginning, and this one we will call the terminal side. We think of that as the end. And we're going to think of this angle as having a certain amount of rotation. We rotate from one to the other. So what I say here is the measure of the angle is the amount of counterclockwise rotation. You'll notice that this is moving in a counterclockwise fashion from the initial side to the terminal side. <clears throat> so however big that is, that's the angle that's in standard position. So this one, for example, looks like it's something in the neighborhood of, you know, maybe 115 degrees. We start pointing perfectly to the right. We rotate in the counterclockwise direction 115 degrees. So take a moment and try drawing these. I will pause. If you're doing this on a video, pause and do these on your own. What does it look like to have an angle in standard position that's 90 degrees, that's 150 degrees, and that's negative 30 degrees? My hope is that you've tried this already. So 90 degrees, we know one side of this angle points exactly to the right. 
we go 90 degrees in the counterclockwise direction, so the other one would be like so. 150 degrees. One side goes like this, 150 degrees, and you don't need a protractor, just do your best. 150 degrees would be almost the full 180. It's pretty close. So something like so would be in the neighborhood of 150 degrees in standard position. And now negative 30 degrees, right? That's backwards. This is different from what you saw in geometry. In geometry, we measured angles and got positive numbers. Here, we're going to be okay with negatives, and that means that there's something backwards. By default, the way we measure an angle is in the counterclockwise orientation. So negative 30 degrees basically means 30 degrees in the backwards orientation. So let's draw a picture of that. So as before, we'll just start with our x and y axes. The initial side always points to the right. And now we're going to imagine we're rotating, quote unquote, backwards 30 degrees. So visualize a 30 degree angle, but visualize that the rotation goes in the clockwise rather than the counterclockwise direction. <clears throat> it might look something like so. So this could be a picture of negative 30 degrees. From a pure geometric point of view, this is a 30 degree angle but we will think of this as being negative 30 degrees in standard position because of how we've rotated. 30 degrees would go up like this. So let me do this in a different color. In green, I'm drawing 30 degrees in standard position. But in pink, we have negative 30 degrees in standard position. There's a symmetry there, and it's based upon the direction in which we spin. We start by pointing to the right. If we rotate in a clockwise direction, that's a positive angle. If we rotate, sorry, if we rotate in a counterclockwise direction, that's a positive angle. If we rotate in a clockwise direction, that's a negative angle. So here's our essential understanding. And this doesn't come up quite yet, but the book rolls it out at the very beginning of the section. The measure of an angle in standard position is the input for two important functions. And the outputs are the coordinates called cosine and sine of a point on the terminal side of the angle that is one unit from the origin. <clears throat> so we'll return to this. But the real idea is that drawing angles in standard position is basically the starting point for computing these things called cosine and sine that we'll be seeing a lot of. The details will come in a little bit. And the idea is that we're going to be thinking about how coordinates in these diagrams are related to the angles. So let's look at an example. So draw an angle in standard position whose terminal side goes through the point negative 4, 0. What is the measure of the angle? So I'm going to draw a rough diagram. In certain cases, we will have nice pre-drawn computerized grids so everything is perfect. But it's important to be able to draw your own rough diagrams. <coughs> Pardon me. So negative 4, 0. Let's get a sense of where that is. Negative 4, 0 is this point right here. So we want to draw an angle in standard position whose terminal side goes through that point. So here's my terminal side. It, has, it starts at the origin and goes through that point. But we know that our initial side always points right. So this might not look like an angle to you. It really just looks like a line. But let's think of this in terms of how much rotation is there. If we were starting pointing right and we rotated so that we were pointed left, we could say that this is a 180 degree angle in standard position. 
The initial side points straight to the right. The terminal side points straight to the left. That's 180 degrees of rotation to get there. And you'll notice I did this in the counterclockwise direction. What if the terminal side goes through the point negative 1, 1? Let's draw that picture. Let's do this a little more accurately. So the point negative 1, 1 is here. So here is my initial side of the angle. My terminal side starts at the origin but goes through this point. And my angle looks like so. I'm going to draw it this way. So this is going to be a negative angle because I'm rotating in the clockwise direction. What we might notice here, and we'll be doing a lot more practice, but x and y are in balance. Our x-coordinate is negative 1, our y-coordinate is 1. 1 is positive and 1 is negative, but they're the same size. x and y are in balance. That means we have an angle that's exactly intermediate between being horizontal and vertical. So just this angle here would be a 45-degree angle. Just this angle here would be a 45 degree angle. So as a pure angular, angular measure, this is 45 degrees here, this is 45 degrees here. Well, how much rotation is that from one side of the angle to the other? This full amount of rotation, well, it would be 90 degrees just to point downwards, and then an additional 45 degrees. So this is 135 degrees of rotation. I'm just doing 90 plus 45 equals 135. But it's in the clockwise orientation. So the angle here would actually be negative 135 degrees in standard position. 135 degrees of rotation, but we do it in a counterclockwise fashion. I'm sorry, in a clockwise fashion. Yikes. Let's do one more. The point 2 comma 2 root 3. So I'm giving you a decimal approximation here. That might be helpful. So I'm going to draw an asymmetrical picture here because everything is positive. So 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. My x coordinate is 2. My y coordinate is 2 root 3, which is approximately 3.4, so somewhere around here. So our point is located here. So here is our terminal side. Here is our initial side. And what we want to be on the lookout for is numbers like square root of 3 or square root of 2, because we've seen those before. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to look at this point and use that point to actually draw a right triangle. I can find a triangle like that lurking in this diagram. I know that this distance here is 2 because my x-coordinate is 2, and I started from 0. So from here to here is a distance of 2. From here to here is a distance of 2 root 3. This is a pattern that hopefully we've recognized. Oh, I have a right triangle, and I'm noticing that in this particular right triangle, the long leg is the short leg times the square root of 3. That's something we see in a 30, 60, 90 triangle. You want to be looking for these. And I will tell you that the 30, 60, 90s and the 45, 45, 90s, intentionally, we will see those coming up over and over again. Because those are the patterns we already know. We don't know rules for other kinds of triangles. So we're going to lean heavily on the ones we already know. So what we know is that this here is a 60 degree angle. This here is a 30 degree angle. 
because lurking in this picture is a 30, 60, 90 triangle, which means big picture, if we're thinking about the total amount of rotation, how much did we rotate to get from one end to the other? Well, this total amount of angular rotation, if we zoom in, is just the amount of angular rotation down here, and that's 60 degrees in the counterclockwise positive orientation. So we're looking at a 60 degree angle in standard notation. Be on the lookout for things like square root of three. When you see square root of three, you want to try to draw a 30, 60, 90 triangle somewhere. You should be able to add to the diagram a little bit to create that kind of triangle. Now, what I want you to do, if you're watching this on the video, go back, look at all of these examples, and see if you can think of a different way of measuring each one of those angles. Hit pause and ask yourself, could I have gotten from my initial side to my terminal side in a different way? So my hope is that you've thought about that a little bit. And let's go back. Here, I drew my picture like so. But I could have said, oh, another way of getting from my initial side to my terminal side would be to rotate in the clockwise direction. This would be 180 degrees of clockwise rotation. So someone else may have said, oh, this isn't 180 degrees. This is actually negative 180 degrees. Both of these make sense. It's just a question of how you view it. Am I getting from this side to this side through counterclockwise rotation or clockwise rotation? Both of these are legitimate answers. Similarly, over here, we rotated 135 degrees in the clockwise orientation. But another way you could have gone there, it's a little bit more rotation, but you could have said, what if I start going in the counterclockwise way? I would spin like so. How much spin is that? Well, it's 90 degrees to get from the beginning of the first quadrant to the end, plus another 90 degrees here, plus 45 degrees here, and that's a total of 225 degrees of counterclockwise or positive rotation. Both of these are acceptable answers. You might look at it as a negative angle of 135 degrees to point in this direction, or you might look at it as a positive angle of 225 degrees to point in this direction. Both of them make sense. Similarly, over here, you could, in theory, have taken the long way and gone backwards negative 300 degrees. <clears throat> or if you were really, you know, kind of an oddball or feeling creative. Another way of doing this, not that this would be the obvious way to do it, but it is a way to do it. If we said we wanted to begin here, and end here. You could have actually said that's 420 degrees of positive rotation. You could have said I'm starting here 90 degrees plus 90 degrees plus 90 degrees plus 90 degrees plus 60 degrees is 420 degrees of rotation. That seems like an unusual way of describing it, but it's not wrong. We are measuring how much rotation gets us from one side of the angle to the other. And if you want to do extra spins, you're allowed to. So this leads us to this definition of what's called coterminal. Two angles are coterminal if they have the same terminal side. We've already seen examples of this. Here, 180 degrees negative 180 degrees, they lead us to the same terminal side of the angle. So those are coterminal. Negative 135 degrees or positive 225 degrees, they lead us to the same terminal side of the angle. These are coterminal angles. Over here, 
60 degrees or negative 300 degrees or 420 degrees, they lead us to the same terminal side of the angle. Those are coterminal angles. So an example would be, what did we say? 180 degrees and negative 180 degrees are coterminal. Negative 135 degrees and 225 degrees are coterminal. 60 degrees or negative 300 degrees or 420 degrees are coterminal. And from a numerical point of view, what you might notice is we can get from one angle to a coterminal angle by just adding or subtracting 360 degrees. And you can do it multiple times if you want. So even without drawing a picture, you could generate answers. So I'm going to improvise a little bit and say, um, list some angles coterminal with, say, 80 degrees. So take a moment and see if you can make sense of the pattern without even drawing a picture. I have 80 degrees, but if I added 360 degrees of rotation to that, I'd get 440 degrees that would point in the same direction. If I wanted to, I could add 360 again, and I would get 800 degrees, that would point in the same direction. Or I could start with 80 degrees and subtract 360 degrees, negative 280. And I could do this as many times as I want to. So anytime you have an angle, there are actually lots and lots of angles that are coterminal. At a certain point, we probably want to deal with smaller numbers. But, you know, if you really wanted to, you could say, oh, I actually have an angle that's, you know, 90 million degrees. That's the legit angle. Okay, let's do this page and then we'll end this video. So by definition, the unit circle, <clears throat> so this, I should have italicized this. This is the phrase you want to know. When you hear the phrase unit circle, you want to know exactly what this is, right? Not just, yeah, it's some kind of circle. You want to know this exactly. By definition, the unit circle is the circle with a radius of one centered at the origin. So <clears throat> we will draw this by hand. Yeah, sometimes we'll be using perfect examples, but here we'll just do our best. So here's the point one comma zero. Here's the point zero comma one. Here's the point negative one zero. Here's the point zero negative one. We are imagining a circle that is centered at the origin and all of the points on this circle are exactly one unit away from that center. So now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to cheat a little bit, just make these dots bigger. These are the four easiest points on the unit circle. The unit circle, centered at the origin, goes around like so. There are infinitely many points on the unit circle. The easiest ones would be this point over here. This is the rightmost point on the unit circle. This is the top point. This is the leftmost point. This is the bottom point. Obviously, along the way, there are all these other points. So this is the unit circle. Really make sure you are studying this. When you hear the phrase unit circle, <coughs> pardon me, you want to be able to draw this picture almost instantly. Um, just as we move forward, I will let you know that Typically, when we talk about angles, we use Greek letters. One reason for that is that you can look at an expression and instantly know you're talking about an angle because you're noticing it uses Greek letters instead of English letters. Um, when we do algebra, our favorite letter to choose for variables is x. It's not always x, but that's kind of our go-to variable. With angles, our go-to choice will be this, the Greek letter theta. So this is what the symbol looks like. It's kind of like a zero with a horizontal uh, slash through it in the middle. 
So here we're going to define two key concepts. So let's suppose we have an angle in standard position. So here's my x-axis. Here's my y-axis. So <clears throat> here is my initial side following the x-axis. Here is my terminal side. I'll just draw it like so. So here is our angle theta. We'll imagine that it's positive. When we talk about what's called the cosine of theta, and the abbreviation for this is COS theta, what we mean by that is the x-coordinate of the point at which the terminal side of the angle intersects the unit circle. So let's add the unit circle to this diagram. Okay, not perfect, but good enough. So we'll imagine this is our unit circle. Here's the point 1, 0. Here's the point 0, 1. Here's the point negative 1, 0. Here's the point 0, negative 1. And we're going to think about this point here. It has an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate. By definition... The x-coordinate is what we're going to call cosine of theta. And if you keep reading, the y-coordinate is what we will call sine of theta. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to think that angles in standard position, whether we draw it or not, interact with the unit circle. And as we spin around, we get different points on the unit circle. So I'm going to redraw this, and I'm going to do some motion. So x-axis, y-axis. Unit circle like so. Let's try this again. Unit circle like so. Oh, let me make that a little bit better. Okay, good enough. So now here is the initial side of the angle. I want you to imagine that the terminal side is in motion. So I can't quite animate this, but I want you to really pay attention to the point where the terminal side <clears throat> intersects the unit circle. So as I move that terminal side, imagine how that point is changing. So if I erase this and redraw it like so, I now have a new point and it's here. So we're going to be moving around this terminal side. Right? And in your mind's eye, I can't draw all of them, but try to pay attention as I move it over here Where's the point where that terminal side intersects the unit circle? Hopefully you can see it. As I move it over here, you can see it. So as I spin around, I'm also just moving around the unit circle. Right? The angle is getting bigger or smaller. As I change the angle, every single angle has a different point on the unit circle. And we can imagine that what's really happening is we're spinning around the unit circle. As the angle changes, this point, right, right now it's here. If I change the angle, made it a little bit bigger, this point goes over here. If I make it much bigger, this point goes over here. If I make the angle smaller, this point's over here. What we're doing here is cosine and sine are basically just keeping track of where is this point? They measure the location of this point. And the location of that point is related to the angle. If I tell you what angle to draw, you draw the angle, you can visualize where this point is, 
And knowing where that point is tells us something about the angle. If I know the angle, I know where this point is. If I know where that point is, right? imagine I just said, oh, I want this point. Well, then you can say, oh, well, then I want to draw my angle to look like this. So there's a correspondence between what does the angle look like in standard position and where is this point on the unit circle. If we know one, we know the other. And cosine and sine are just measuring where that point is. So I'm going to pause right now, and in the second part of this video, we'll actually try thinking about the values for cosine and sine.